Good afternoon and welcome uh, to another webinar on the Innovation Fund. Very happy that you take out the time and join us for learning more about the results of the last call uh, for small-scale projects and how uh, Innovation Fund projects can be supported by uh, national support as well. So, this is the agenda that we've prepared for you for the next uh, two hours. I will give a, a short introduction, and then uh, Marion will present uh, in quite some detail the results of the uh, first call for small-scale projects. So pretty much in, uh, in the same style as we've done for the, for the first stage for the large-scale projects. And then uh, Roman and Laura uh, will present the lessons learned from the first call for small-scale projects. So for also for you to know what, uh, what can be done better, but also for us what we can do, do better. Then the second hour of today's uh, webinar is, uh, is dedicated to the co-financing uh, with state aid, with national money, or also the, the pure financing by, by state aid. Uh, we are very, very happy to have Jan from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency uh, to give us some insights into the Dutch uh, uh, program, which is called SDE++. And then um, Alejandro from uh, DigiComp will give us an overview on the revised climate, energy, and environmental aid guidelines. And I think this is very interesting stuff because you will see that the, uh, with the new proposal, it will be much easier to combine the financing from the uh, Innovation Fund with, um, with national money. Um, as usual, uh, please go on, uh, on Slido and put your, your questions there. And uh, as you see, we have prepared uh, two rounds uh, of discussion. The first one uh, after the, the full presentation on the call for small-scale projects, and then one at the end. So for me, it's to give you a bit of an overview, uh, like also on the next, uh, next key, key dates. Uh, very soon, we will launch um, our new, our second call for large-scale projects. That's on the 26th. Of, uh, of October. Um, as you know, uh, it's a big call, 50% more money, so a total volume of 1.5 uh, billion. Uh, you will have uh, until March uh, to submit your proposals, I think more exactly until the 3rd of March uh, 22, and then the results would already come in July uh, next year because we moved to a single stage. Uh, evaluation. So this would be, uh, of course, for new projects. So if you try the first time to apply uh, with us at the Innovation Fund, but also all projects from uh, the first call who, who, who will not uh, uh, manage to get already a grant in the first call are more than welcome to uh, resubmit and to also, also benefit from all the good advice that they got from the evaluators. Uh, in the same way, we will open the second uh, call for small-scale projects uh, a little bit later, in March uh, 22, uh, with a submission deadline in August 22, and uh, then the results would come early, early 23, again uh, with a volume of 100 million as the first call. So you see, we get into uh, this, uh, this yearly cycle of having each year a call for large-scale projects and a call for small scale projects, and I think we, uh, we would be very keen to keep this rhythm, to always have the call for small scale projects in uh, spring, and the one for the large scale projects then uh, launching always in, uh, in autumn. So um, we also have uh, more events lined up uh, for you. On the 21st of October, we will have a session within uh, uh, the European Sustainable Energy Week, where we will also talk about uh, the, the Innovation Fund, uh, maybe also going a little bit into uh, the new, new proposals uh, with which we come out in, um, in July. 
where we propose the uh, extension, the enlargement of the innovation fund. So I think effectively the doubling of the size and also new ways of, uh, of offering our money, in particular contracts for different. So that we can not only support like first of a kind projects, but also then go a little bit more into the, the rollout implementation of, uh, of these new technologies that we all want for 2050. Uh, then uh, a very important uh, event on the 4th of November during uh, the next uh, uh, climate conference, the COP26, we will sign our first uh, grant agreements, I think with three uh, projects from the call for small scale projects. So there you also see how quickly we, uh, we want to follow up with the grant preparation to really get the, the money out, uh, out there. And then on 10th of November, uh, we want to dive into uh, the new call text for the second call for large scale projects. I think what I can already say now is we will only do uh, quite a limited amount of changes. So we are very much aware that we follow up very quickly with the, with the second uh, call. And this is also why we want to keep uh, the call text pretty stable. Uh, but there are like some, some things where we see, okay, this can really be improved based on the, on the lessons learned from, the first day, from, uh, from both stages of the large scale call, but also a bit from, uh, from the small scale call, which allows me to immediately uh, hand over to, to Marion to get, um, get started on, uh, on the results, on a deep dive into the results of the small scale call. Marion. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Christian. Um, so I'm indeed going to present some statistics, quantitative analysis regarding the results of the um, first call for small scale projects um, for which the results were announced um, over the summer at the very end of July. And in fact, this is the, our very first occasion to gather and to um, present some analysis about the results of this, um, of this call, which is the, um, also the very first call in the history of the Innovation Fund for which we have reached such an advanced uh, stage in, um, in, in the selection process. So starting off with a general slide on general um, figures about this call for proposals, 232 proposals were submitted by uh, the deadline of the call, which was in March of 2021. Out of these 232, 175 proposals were deemed admissible and um, eligible by CINEA, meaning that these 175 proposals were subsequently subject to the um, evaluation uh, of, uh, of the, the, the application by the independent experts. And 38 proposals of these 175 were fi found by evaluators to pass all the thresholds and minimum requirements included in the text of the call for proposals. Out of these 38, 32 proposals were selected for grant preparation, which is what we announced back in July. And collectively, this, these 32 proposals are requesting a total of 118.4 million euros of support. Now with this slide, I show an overview of the selected projects, so both in terms of their geographical location and of the sector of these, uh, of these selected projects. So as you can see, we have a very wide coverage, bo both in terms of sectors and in terms of member states, because we have projects that 
have been um, selected for grant preparation in tot a total of 14 countries, including 12 EU member states, plus Norway and Iceland. And as you can see from, um, from the map, we also including have a number of projects of, well, that were um, selected for grant preparation that are located in Central and Eastern European member states. So two in Poland, two in Croatia, and also one was offered uh, grant preparation in Estonia. And um, the countries with the highest number of selected projects are France, Spain, and Sweden. In terms of sectors, we have projects covering 14 different uh, sectors that were uh, selected um, as a result of the, the evaluation process. And in the next slides, I will dig deeper into uh, this question of the, the, the sectors and the, the technologies covered. So how does the the does it look like looks like in terms of um, the sectors and categories of uh, sectors that were um, selected um, as an outcome of the selection process? In this slide, we have grouped the sectors in three broad categories: renewable energy, energy intensive industry, and um, energy storage. And what this slide shows you is that the highest number of selected projects can be found in energy intensive industry with 13 uh, selected projects for this category. But the category which had the highest success rate of all three is actually storage with nine selected projects out of a total of 33 eligible projects for this category of energy storage. How does that translate in terms of um, technological pathway? Well, as you can see from the uh, chart at the right hand side of this slide, the selected projects cover a very wide range of um, technological routes. So really all the pathways that are needed to reach um, our decarbonization um, objectives from hydrogen to bio-based solutions, CCUS, recycling, reuse, energy storage, you name it. In the following slides, I will zoom in on each of these different categories. So starting with energy intensive industries, so the category with the highest number of selected projects. What can we observe on this slide? Well, the first um, telling fact is that sector hydrogen is the sector which had the highest number of um, applications from this category, and also the highest number of selected projects with four projects. And as you can see, when it comes to the category energy intensive industries, the, um, the, the, the rest of the selected projects really represents a very good mix of um, different sectors. So we had many different energy uh, intensive industry sectors that had at least one um, selected project, with the notable um, exception of uh, cement and lime, which for which we received nine um, applications, but none of these got selected in the end. And having taken a closer look at the statistics behind, we cannot really see a pattern. It's really project specific, specific the reasons for why, for why we do not have any cement or lime project in the end. There is no clear trend. Now, moving on to renewable energy. Here we see, when it comes to renewable energy, quite a contrasting uh, picture across sectors. Because you see, for instance, that um, in the wind, uh, wind projects had a very high success rate because we have two selected projects in the wind sector out of and a number of three eligible projects, so very high success rate, but it's also a low number of applications, so it's difficult to draw some conclusions. However, if you look, for instance, at the results for the solar sector, where we had 24 um, eligible projects, the success rate, by contrast to wind, is very low because we only had three, um, three successful uh, projects. And here, 
um, we can see, uh, having a look at the, the, the scores of these projects, a clearer pattern. So in the solar sector, it seems that a lot of projects did not uh, reach minimum threshold for degree of innovation. So indicating that um, many projects that applied probably were not um, innovative enough and yeah, probably could uh, find other instruments that are better suited for their needs than the innovation fund. On this slide, you can also observe that uh, sector biofuels and biorefineries also had quite a low success rate with two projects out of 15 eligible projects that were selected. And here it's more, for this sector, it's more the criterion maturity that seemed to have been a determining, um, determining factor. And finally, the third category is energy storage, where really the success rate um, is the highest and by far of the three categories, with 27% of eligible projects in this in energy storage that um, were selected for, for grant preparation. Here, in fact, it's a category which is composed of only two different sectors, intra electricity storage and other ener energy storage. And here, the, as you can see from this, uh, this slide, the picture is quite, uh, quite similar for these two, these two sectors. So both of them had um, a relatively high success rate. In the next um, slides, I'm going to um, now dive into the, um, the scores of these different uh, groups of projects to see how they fared uh, against the different uh, selection criteria. But I will start by recalling the, 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 the cascade approach that was adopted in the context of the small-scale coal. And this is, in fact, important to remind in this context because the, this cascade approach has an impact on the number of projects that um, was assessed against the different criteria. So explaining that the cohort of projects um, that was scored differs uh, in almost each of the, of the, of the different uh, criteria, which can have an impact on the, on the statistics. So just to recall, we had this three-step approach when it comes to the cascade, where all, pro all eligible projects were assessed against innovation, and those projects that um, passed the minimum threshold of degree innovation were assessed against greenhouse gases emissions avoidance and project maturity. And then only those projects that met minimum requirements and minimum threshold for these two award criteria were assessed against scalability and cost efficiency. So how did the projects score in the evaluation process. Well, here on this slide, you see the distribution of uh, total scores. So um, on all of the, the criteria, well, at least for when the projects were um, assessed against all criteria. So as explained on the slide before, on this slide, you have the, the, um, some projects which were assessed against all criteria, but notably the bar at the right hand side was not assessed against all um, the, the, the different selection criteria. So here, the main message from this slide is that to be selected for grant preparation, a project must um, have a high score uh, overall in, in all criteria. So as you can see, most of the, well, the, the, in the cohort of the 32 selected projects, which is the bar at the left of the graph, the median and the average score was 28 points out of 35, so which is quite a, um, a high score. And you will see in the previous, um, sorry, in the following slides, when I dig deeper into the scores received in the different criteria, that indeed, of course, projects had high scores in all the different selected uh, selection criteria, but that some, um, some nuances, some slight differences uh, can be seen 
um, across the different criteria. Another telling fact is that uh, 137 projects failed at least one award criterion, which uh, amounts to almost 80% of all eligible projects, so showing that there really scope for improvement um, in the understanding of the key, key criteria requirements when writing the application. So on this slide with this, um, this waterfall graph, you see um, how the different projects, well, how the, the projects fared in the different selection criteria in which um, criteria were in, yeah, determining in terms of failing projects. So as mentioned already, we had 175 eligible projects that were assessed against degree of innovation. And 63 of these 175 projects did not pass the minimum threshold of degree of innovation. As a result of which, only 112 projects were assessed against project maturity and greenhouse gases emissions avoidance. 74 out of these 112 projects failed either project maturity or greenhouse gases avoidance requirements. And here, the breakdown is the following. We had 67 projects which failed financial maturity, so showing how determining a criterion financial, a sub-criterion financial maturity can be. 43 projects failed implementation maturity and 18 projects did not meet the greenhouse gases requirements or had manifest errors and therefore did not make it to the last um, stage in the cascade. Now in this slide, um, you can see a picture of how the projects fared um, in relation to criterion degree of innovation. And here, the, the, an important message is that, so I said 63 projects um, passed a degree of innovation out of 175, so that it means that more than 60% of eligible projects scored above the minimum threshold. But what we can observe is that 75% of selected projects scored very high on the degree of innovation. So they got a score which of four or more points. So really, the, only the projects which got top marks in degree of innovation made it to the list of projects that were selected for grant preparation. On this slide, quickly, we have a um, comparison with the scores of projects that were invited to the second round of evaluation in the context of the call for projects for large-scale projects, for which the second round is still, is still ongoing. But here, what you can see on the left-hand side of this graph is that the distribution of score for small-scale and large-scale projects invited for second round um, is extremely similar. <laughs> so you see that it's, uh, it's basically the same spread and uh, the median is also the same and uh, the mean is also very similar. So uh, only the, 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 the average is sli slightly, slightly higher for uh, large scale projects invited to second round. But uh, yeah, mostly it's, uh, it's a picture which is very, very similar. Now moving on to criterion greenhouse gases um, emissions avoidance. Um, so here again, the scores are only about uh, results of small scale coal, um, of the small scale coal. In the next slide, I will show the comparison with the first round of large scale. So as mentioned, 18 applications were not selected because they failed either minimum greenhouse gases requirements or had manifest errors. 
and the distribution of scores here among the selected projects is quite um, wide. So by contrast to a degree of innovation where the, scored were really, where the scores of selected projects were really high, really top, top scores, here we see a much um, wider spread. Okay, <laughs> now, on this, now on this slide, you see um, the comparison when it comes to this, uh, these scores on greenhouse gases avoidance compared to projects that were invited to the second stage evaluation of the large scale coal. And um, yeah, when it comes to the, to, the, to the distribution, again, well, it's the similarities are not as high as for degree of innovation, but you can see that the picture is also to some extent similar. So the spread is a bit higher uh, when it comes to the small scale because um, the, the, the bottom score was 0 0.5 points lower than the projects that were invited to second stage for the, the large scale project, but otherwise it's, it's, it's quite similar. We also had in the context of small scale projects, a larger number of projects that received um, top marks. So yes, to, to, to summarize basically, a bit similar picture, but a bit of a larger um, spread when it comes to the small scale call. With this slide where I'm move, moving back exclusively to only the small scale coal, you see the results of the score for both um, absolute and relative uh, greenhouse gases emissions avoidance sub-criteria. And what is quite striking is that the pattern of scores for these two sub-criteria differs quite importantly. So on the left-hand side, you have the distribution of scores for absolute greenhouse gases emissions avoidance, where you see that um, among the cohort of 32 selected projects, there is a very high spread of scores in greenhouse gases absolute emissions avoidance, actually spanning um, the totality of the scale uh, that was possible to, to give um, a sector. Uh, a project, sorry. However, this is counterbalanced by the right-hand side where you see that um, the scores is m are much more condensed uh, for selected projects in the um, top marks. Meaning that in the court of selected projects, some projects which received low score for absolute greenhouse gases emissions were able to compensate by a high score in relative emissions avoidance and make it to the list of successful projects. Moving on to uh, project maturity criterion, as uh, already mentioned, um, a really important message is that financial maturity is really a determining um, sub-criterion because looking at the, the rates of um, projects that pass the different minimum thresholds, we observe that 40% um, of projects that were assessed against degree of innovation failed degree of innovation, 40% of projects that were assessed against implementation maturity failed implementation maturity, but when it comes to financial maturity, it is 60% of projects that were assessed against financial maturity that failed financial maturity. So really an important sub-criterion to, um, which is yeah, determining as to whether a project will eventually make it to the reserve list, uh, to the, sorry, list of successful projects. So this is really the, the main message. Here you see also from the distribution of score on financial maturity that the, um, among the, the group of selected projects, the scores are quite uh, close to the threshold. So we did not have selected projects which scored the top mark. Uh, most, um, of, well, actually the, 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 the median of uh, selected projects is at 3.5 
um, points of score, which is relatively low, for instance, compared to degree of innovation where the scores were really high. And in implementation maturity, what you can observe on the right-hand side is that the, the scores of selected projects, notably, tended to be higher than in financial maturity. On this slide, um, you can see, uh, again, a comparison for the financial maturity score between the small-scale call and the outcome of the first stage evaluation of the large-scale call, where you can yeah, basically observe that the um, overall, the, the, the spread of scores among uh, invited projects or selected projects for small-scale call um, so the spread was higher for invited projects to the second round of large-scale projects than for small-scale projects, and also that um, the median score and the average score was also higher in uh, the context of um, the invited projects to the second round of large-scale call. But these are, of course, results just based on um, the outcome of one call. Um, so to be seen with the repetition of calls in the future, what uh, more consolidated data we can, we can um, obtain based on a larger number of um, selected projects. And with this last slide, um, I give a picture of the scores for scalability and cost efficiency, where uh, here really the, the what strikes uh, when looking at the, these, uh, these graphs is that the scores were really high for both um, of these criteria, both for scalability and for cost efficiency. We have 75% of selected projects that scored for or above um, for these two uh, criteria. And you can also observe that for cost efficiency, we had a very high um, spread of scores um, among the projects that in the end were not, um, were not selected. I will leave it at that for the quantitative uh, analysis and uh, pass the floor on to Roman uh, for a more qualitative analysis on tips and tricks for how to <laughs> be successful in your application to the Innovation Fund. Thank you, Marion. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Very happy to be here. Uh, this will be a joint presentation by myself and uh, um, Laura Pereira from, uh, from ICF. Uh, we will walk you through a couple of slides where we have tried to capture, uh, let's say, the key issues that we saw in the applications uh, when evaluating your proposals, when uh, the key recommendations and tips and tricks for good applications in the in the next next call, I will also be joined for the uh, questions and answers session by colleagues from uh, from Sinea, uh, Uwe Lutzen, uh, and uh, uh, Alexandra Kobart, who can join us uh, to answer your questions. So let's go for it. Okay, so uh, I already saw some questions in Slido as regards uh, uh, admissibility and eligibility uh, and uh, how did they fare in the overall results. So here you see that out of 232 projects, 34 were deemed not ad admissible, which means they were incomplete. Uh, either they were missing parts of the application form or uh, uh, the mandatory documents which are prescribed in the call text. So it's very important that your project is complete. And 21 projects that were deemed non-eligible, which means they failed to meet uh, the call conditions and requirements, uh, such as um, uh, uh, they uh, were not within the monitoring and reporting period of three years, uh, or they were out of innovation funds eligibility or investment scope, or they were out of the total expenditure allowed under the small-scale projects. So what does it mean in terms of tips and tricks for you 
here and I'll try to Angelo maybe you can okay so first of all uh, we saw many many projects that uh, were not um, I would say ready uh, in in terms of how they were presented so please start your application early on not to the last moment uh, please read very carefully all the requirements related to the call in the call text the necessary uh, documentation uh, and uh, check the ad admissibility and eligibility uh, requirements do not wait for the last day for submission of your application uh, always count there may be IT bugs there may be issues with submission so try to do this early on uh, and uh, especially uh, use the, the documentation application form and templates that are specific for the innovation fund uh, do not try to reuse uh, uh, the, the forms from another programs because the innovation fund has a specific uh, templates for you Okay. Now, degree of innovation. So this is uh, uh, first of the criteria under the Innovation Fund. Uh, just to recall what uh, are the evaluators looking at, there are two sub-criteria, uh, the extent to which the project goes beyond state of the art and the extent to which the project goes beyond incremental innovation. Here you see uh, it looks complicated, but it is not, uh, rather the elements of a good presentation um, uh, of, of the project. So what are the steps to present your project uh, in the way that you can convince the evaluators that indeed your project goes beyond stand of the art and goes beyond the incremental? First of all, and very important, uh, it is important that you establish what is the relevant state of the art in the technology, whether it comes to technological or commercial state of the art. You need to set very clearly what is uh, the, uh, the state of the art to which your project is compared. Then in the next step, um, it's very important that you very clearly explain why the innovation uh, that you are proposing goes beyond the incremental innovation. Why is it really going beyond? Why is it important? And uh, how innovative your project is. And in the third, uh, uh, do not uh, forget to provide the key performance data. All claims in the applications are assessed, and they are assessed based on the evidence that you provide either in your application form or in the attached documentation, such as feasibility study. The more evidence you provide, the clearer the case is, the clearer it is for the evaluators to judge and assess and provide a good, uh, good evaluation. So some tips and tricks uh, for, for the degree of innovation. No. Okay. This does not work. Okay. Uh, first of all, be uh, be exhaustive and underpin your claims with evidence, and uh, uh, always compare the proposed innovation with the commercial and technological state of the art. Moving on to implementation maturity, uh, Marion mentioned that. Uh, um, uh, the second important criterion under the Innovation Fund is the project maturity. In the small scale call, this is then um, uh, broken down to two sub-criteria, the implementation and financial maturity. Combined, the project maturity has been the determining factor in selecting the projects. Um, more than 70 projects failed, the project maturity. Uh, so it is important that you really understand uh, that the Innovation Fund focuses on projects that can make it on the market, that are already mature enough to roll out and being implemented in the marketplace in the time that is given by the proposer at the time of the application. Uh, here, under the implementation maturity, uh, the evaluators look at the degree of technology readiness and uh, the extent to which your technology is able to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions that you are proposing. Uh, they are looking at the credibility of your business model. They are looking at the solidity of uh, your planning, of your milestones, uh, of the steps that you intend to achieve in the time proposed. Uh, uh, they are looking at the track record and quality of the team behind the project, who you are, 
uh, do you have partners that have solid track record to ensure that the project is implemented within the given framework? And of course, they are looking at the strategy for ensuring that your key supply or offtake contracts are being fulfilled in time according to your proposal. So here, what are our key tips and tricks uh, of uh, um, how to address this properly? Uh, on the planning and, uh, and putting uh, your project into a logical structure of steps, activities, and time, always associate your work packages, as we call this uh, grouping of activities, with their planned costs, define the timeline, that is comprehensive, realistic, and consistent across your documentation. Make sure that the activities are proportional to the claimed budget. This is very important. That shows the level of how realistically you are able to estimate your activities uh, going forward. Undep underpin any information you provide uh, on the technical maturity, again, with credible evidence, whether through the, uh, um, uh, the feasibility study or due diligence report where such report is available. Uh, very important element that we also saw, uh, and it shows very clearly to the evaluators, whether you do understand the risks, is your own risk analysis. We are proposing to use uh, an example of heat mapping that you can see also on the picture. Be very, very comprehensive here. Uh, try to put the risks that are essential for the success of the project and always provide credible mitigation activities and mitigation measures that can address those risks. And again, the question of consistency uh, between your implementation plan, feasibility study, and the business plan that needs to be there uh, and will not raise questions by, by the evaluators. Next, uh, that is very, again, important as shown during the evaluation, uh, I think we heard 67 projects failed financial maturity criterion. Uh, so it is a determining factor for many, many of the projects. Here, uh, we have a couple of tips and tricks how to, to put your proposal in the right shape, in the right order. What are the key issues that you need to look at the financial maturity? First of all, uh, we have uh, a template for um, uh, a financial model summary sheet that you need to uh, fill in. And this uh, full financial model needs to cover the entire project timeline. And it needs to be consistent with the project milestones. So pay attention to, uh, to, the, to the financial model that you will submit. Again, it is not just for the three years that is the monitoring and reporting period. It needs to cover the full project lifetime. Second, ensure that um, the financial projections that you are uh, putting in your proposal are coherent with your assumptions on the business model. Will your revenues materialize? Uh, are they realistic? Uh, what are the risks? What are the costs? What are the prices on the market? Is this somehow coherent and well presented in your business plan in the, in the application? Uh, when calculating the weighted average cost of capital, uh, or an internal rate of return, uh, make sure that they adequately request the risk of the project. It is important that if you set certain debt equity ratio, this is achievable by the project, taking into account the market, taking into account the sector, taking into account the risk of the project. Uh, it is important that you put a, a good justification for your assumptions, your expectations, and again, underpin this with evidence. Uh, another uh, element that we saw uh, when presenting the, the revenues and cost assumptions, often projects that didn't make it were incoherent, were not transparent, were not clear, uh, the data were not underpinned by, uh, by, by evidence. So here, again, be, uh, uh, be thorough and try to substantiate the main revenues and cost assumptions and be very transparent about your capex, about your cap capital expenditure. Uh, what we also saw sometimes, it's important that you do not underestimate them, just to fall within uh, the eligibilities of the small-scale call. If your project is bigger, then the clear recommendation is apply to the large-scale call. As we saw in the presentation of Marion, also, small-scale project can make it in the large-scale uh, context if they go beyond 7.5 million of capital expenditure. Um, 
when you uh, are counting with certain cost contingencies in the capital, capital expenditure, um, uh, this is in principle allowed, but what we are looking for is whether they are justified and whether they are in line with the market practice. And you need to justify this in your reasoning in the application. Continued uh, uh, tips and tricks. Uh, when you are uh, planning to uh, finance your project through debt financing, um, again, especially in the projects where you uh, are on the shaky grounds as regards the future cash flows, where uh, the prices are volatile or whether you have um, a weak recourse to the, uh, to the, to the shareholders, uh, try to count or, or put your, your projections based on your predicted uh, cash flows, and if possible, demonstrated by long-term offtake contracts. So be thorough in pre preparation and explanation on your future revenues that ideally should be already based on at least pre-discussed future agreements with your, with your future customers. This is very important. Although you have up to four years to reach financial close, nevertheless, uh, many projects that failed simply did not get to the stage where they, they were able to justify their future revenues. As uh, said before, it's important that you underpin uh, your claims with evidence. This also includes your potential contracts, whether they are uh, your supply or your offtake contracts. They don't need to be signed at the moment of application, but uh, obviously the deeper you go, the deeper uh, evidence you can provide, and more credible uh, evidence you provide, the better. This also goes uh, to, the, to your potential project uh, uh, funders and owners. Again, clearer and more robust uh, evidence, uh, either from your shareholders or um, any other parties who are expected to finance the project, the better. I already mentioned uh, the, the the elements related to equity and debt financing. We saw many times uh, projects claiming, yes, we will finance this project via 70% of debt, but then there was no uh, letter uh, of even indicative support from their potential banker, from their potential uh, debt financier provider. And again, if such claim is in the application, the evaluators don't think they are really credible. So take this into account when putting your financial structure together, Try to prepare and see your application through the eyes of an evaluator whose job is to act as our uh, investment banker, whose job is to assess the risks and credibility of the claims in the applications. Okay, uh, if we move to the next, which is the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, here I pass the floor to Laura Pereira. I hope, Laura, we can hear each other. Over to you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, excellent. Perfect. Good afternoon. I'm Laura Pereira, and I'll very briefly talk about the best practices observed in the quantification and reporting of the GEG emissions avoidance criteria, uh, which is composed by two criteria, the absolute um, JG emissions avoidance and the relative JG emissions avoidance. But before we talk about this best practices, um, can you change the slide, please? Um, I just want to highlight the top three mistakes our evaluators observed in the submissions for the small scale call, with, which differ slightly from those observed for the large scale. We already noticed the improvement, uh, hopefully, uh, from the webinars and uh, uh, the presentation we've done. They helped uh, uh, the small scale applicants to improve the submissions. So the first one, even though we have emphasized in every single presentation the importance of documenting and referencing all the assumptions adopted, we still received several applications with those embedded in the calculations or scattered across documents which make evaluators spend much more time trying to figure out where data comes from or refers to. So it's your own interest that CNA evaluators are able to review the quality of the assumptions adopted by applicants, not only yours, but 
from the companies you're com projects you're competing against because that's how we will ensure that you're comp competing against projects that use a realistic and proven scenario uh, the second point we also receive applications that deviated from the methodology some submitted their own methodology to estimate savings others opted for an emission uh, factor different from the one set in the methodology. So for instance, they use an emission factor for coal instead of natural gas uh, for renewable heating production projects. So even though the methodology clearly stated that these were fixed, but if they use uh, coal, which is perhaps the natural reality, the local reality, they would uh, the savings would be larger. Um, and I would talk about this, how they can claim these additional savings, but uh, uh, for the methodology, for estimated the, the criteria, they should stick to the methodology. And the third point um, refers to applicants that did not use the calculations tools uh, provided. Uh, and, and as such, they presented more mistakes uh, either in the conversions and selecting the mission factors and in aligning their project to the methodology. So as Raman uh, pointed out, please make use uh, and take advantage of the templates we have carefully prepared and tailored for the Innovation Fund. And each, uh, each round of the call, we improve, we, we implement the lessons that we learned. Um, so next slide, please. So we have compiled all the practices um, in a form of five action points that you can follow to improve the quality of your submission. Our primary goal with these tips is not, to, uh, not only to reduce potential errors that can lead to your project failing. So, I mean, uh, how many manifest errors of the 18 projects failing the, the criteria could have been avoided if you perhaps aligned to the methodology uh, and, and submitted a, a clear uh, template with your calculations. Um, but uh, our secondary goal uh, is also to ensure that it, uh, your project scores all the points it can score. As you saw in Marion's presentation, this is a very competitive process with high quality applications. So any uh, points lost due to poorly evidenced calculations uh, may result in your project uh, losing a, a position to another one with flawless calculations, which perhaps it's, uh, it's not as innovative, uh, but presented better. So I won't go through all, all these points as most of them will reflect what applicants should do to avoid mis the mistakes already mentioned, follow the methodology, use the provided tools. Um, but um, the point, the one point I would like to re reiterate here uh, refers to sticking to the boundaries. Uh, that have been defined for each of the sectors, energy intensive industries, CCS, renewables, and uh, energy storage. Uh, I recall that if you have uh, GAG savings that go beyond the boundaries defined in your sector, uh, you cannot add this in your calculation of absolute emissions avoidance, but you can claim them and get extra points, uh, if you, but you need to submit this separately. Um, and so the only point here that we haven't touched was to present only the information required. Uh, we have we we received applications with a lot of information that was not use, used used uh, to that was not relevant for what was being calculated and made all the submission more confusing. It was um, having to track down what is what what was the absolute emissions avoidance and what was this. Uh, negligible or that you can discard. So make it tidy, clean, just what is being required uh, when you submit your calculation. Next slide. So here are two other tips, which again have been somehow uh, covered. Um, one important thing that I want to mention about these best practices is that our intention, it, it's not, again, it's not simply report back to you. It's like, oh, what's good, uh, what what the mistakes are. Uh, we, we've been actively using these lessons to improve your experience, the methodology, the tools, uh, every round. So the same way we've taken advantage from the experience with the first stage 
of the large scale call to improve the tools and the guidance uh, for your call. We have done the same for the second stage and the upcoming calls. Um, so for instance, in tip number five, uh, we know the importance of properly documenting and referencing the assumptions and emission factors. And this resulted in the creation of a separate tab uh, that, that's already embedded in the calculation tool that you receive as part of the package. And you shall use to document any quantitative or qualitative assumptions that you use to project consumption, project production, or composition of gas, anything that you use, instead of uh, writing down in a paper, you put there, add your reference, add the link if it's relevant, or the paper, reference the paper that you're referring to. And this will be so that evaluators can be able to track down and check whether this is um, adequate. Um, so we encourage you to spend some time spelling this out uh, to ensure it's all robust. Uh, the uh, tip number four, uh, it clearly report quantifiable, <laughs> quantified absolute and relative emissions avoidance. These mistakes we observed a lot in the large scale call and much less uh, in the small scale call. Uh, for instance, figures uh, that were uh, reported in the tool didn't match uh, the ones reported in the form or the ones in, reported in the form were split in several uh, for each parameter, so the evaluators would have to add them up. Uh, so it's just declare upfront, these are the absolute emissions avoidance and to make sure that it match the one that's going to two. It's, it uh, seems straightforward, it seems logic, but we still observe that. So uh, we, we kept these top tips and, and I hope these are useful. And, uh, and the next webinar we will be presenting all each improvement we've done to the tools and to the methodology and we'll see that a lot has improved and make your submission easier. That's all for me. I'll hand over back to Roman. Uh, thank you, uh, Laura. Uh, so let's let's continue with uh, the the uh, the award criteria and um, the lessons learned and tips and tricks. So let's move to scalability which in essence means the growth potential of your project, uh, whether this is at the level of your project site, whether it is at the level of your region, or whether this is um, in the sectoral scope, or whether this is economy-wide, uh, especially looking into EU value-added value chains. Here, uh, what we saw, uh, uh, and we could pass on as tips and tricks for you, uh, again, be comprehensive uh, when you are preparing your communication strategy and dissemination strategy because part of the scalability criterion is also the quality of your knowledge sharing activities in the project and your communication and dissemination activities. Uh, be very clear as regards your intellectual property rights and licensing issues. This is uh, important if you are uh, planning to scale up your, your project, your technology, uh, if you are planning selling uh, the technological know-how further in order in order to scale up so again in your application try to be as clear as possible uh, also think of any necessary adjustments if you are going to scale up your technology later on so what those adjustments are there uh, uh, are they already considered in the application do you have enough evidence that this will be essentially possible uh, if you are claiming that you will uh, expand your technology in, uh, in other places or uh, in size. Provide always the detailed assumptions uh, as regards uh, the future cost reduction expectations. Uh, try to really be realistic and try to base them as much as possible on any available evidence that you can provide. Uh, substantiate uh, the potential for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have seen many projects uh, where there was a bit of a greenwashing. We are uh, planning to scale this specific technology in many, many sites, but there was no evidence. There was no um, uh, deeper consideration how this is possible and on which basis such claim are being presented. So be careful about these things. The evaluators, again, are really thorough in looking into uh, the, the claims that you are putting against any evidence that you provide in your application. And I think the last one from me, 
which is a bit repetitive, but I thought it's important that we recommend again to be consistent, clear, and ensure that you look forward. So what is your project, uh, what will your project look like in four, five years? Uh, will it still be there? And how can you ensure that it will already at the stage that the project is uh, submitted to the Innovation Fund? So first of all, be realistic in your assumptions, in your claims, in your calculations. Second, be very clear on your setup on the legal and organizational structure of the project. Who are your partners? Will you set up a special purpose vehicle? Are you clear in organi organizational and legal relationships between different parties? And how can you evidence that essentially such a structure is able to be put in place in time with the resources and in the framework that you are proposing in the application? Ensure that your claims are consistent across the, uh, the project documentation, whether these are numbers, whether these are expectations, whether these are costs or greenhouse gas emissions. And the last related to security, uh, which is again a, a, a real example, uh, that's why we are putting this uh, on the slide. If you depend on future tendering, on future licensing, if you are dependent on public procurement procedure, which will give or not ensure that your business model can continue in the future, make sure already at the stage of application that all parties that are the important ones on which you depend are in line with your project proposal. That you are not coming to uh, a, a situation that you are ready, but unfortunately your project cannot go ahead due to decisions that are going beyond a pure project composition. But be sure that you have those parties involved and you have a very clear support already at the stage when you are applying. So this is uh, uh, the, the set of recommendations and, uh, and examples from, from what we saw in the applications. Uh, I have one more message uh, uh, for those who are interested. Uh, we have opened the call for uh, expert evaluators looking, for, looking to extend the family of experts for the Innovation Fund. So please follow us. On, the, on our websites, you will find more information on the Innovation Fund or CINEA websites, and please do not hesitate to uh, submit your application also as an expert evaluator if this is interesting for you. Thank you very much, and shall I pass the floor, I think, to Christian? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Marion, Roman, Laura, uh, for this very rich uh, presentation, and um, you will, of course, find uh, all the slides um, then on our website and the video on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we are running a bit late, but I think, nevertheless, uh, we should go into some, some questions. So we have uh, Roma, Marion, Laura here. Uh, we also have online uh, Maria and then uh, uh, Alec, Alexandre and, and Uwe from, uh, from Cinea. And before we get into into the questions, maybe one, one more thank you for, to ICF, to our consultants, for doing all the analysis, all the assessment, um, also a little bit on, on short, uh, short time. But I think it's, it's really worth having all this, um, this data here. And I think we are getting also into a more standardized presentation of the, of the results. So, but now on to your, to your questions. So, the first one is about... Um, small-scale projects in um, inland shipping that uh, roll out innovative uh, techniques for, for the first, uh, first time, uh, so not necessarily pilot, uh, but innovative propulsion techniques, uh, batteries, and fuel cells. Do they fall um, within, within the scope? Did we have uh, such, um, such projects, Roman? Yes, such projects uh, fall within the scope. Uh, it's always important that any project uh, uh, applying for funding leads to significant greenhouse gas emissions avoidance. And it must be innovative. It must be within the scope of the Innovation Fund. We have seen in the small-scale call uh, projects, um, for instance, on hydrogen, urban transport, or indeed um, uh, clean shipping, uh, um, clean ferries, um, um, uh, either electric or hydrogen. Uh, propulsion uh, technology. So yes, uh, such projects are perfectly well within the scope. Okay, 
now we seem to be going into tree planting. So um, can the Innovation Fund also uh, support the planting of trees? Roman, do you want to also take this one? I'll try, and, uh, and you may compliment, Christian. Um, uh, tree planting is not eligible as such under the Innovation Fund. Uh, you may consider, uh, for instance, BOCCS projects where uh, you would use sustainably um, uh, um, planted biomass uh, in line with the provisions of the RED uh, directive and our requirements in the call. But in such case, your project would either be falling under the energy intensive industry or renewables. But just planting trees is not, unfortunately, uh, to be covered by the Innovation Fund. Yes, we have other uh, funding means for this. Huh? So we have an important uh, initiative under, um, under the first strategy for planting 3 billion additional trees in Europe. So you may want to look uh, into this. But of course, what is important for a lot of, um, uh, of projects in the Innovation Fund is, of course, that uh, if you use bioenergy, that you uh, source that uh, sustainably and that you check the criteria of the um, uh, applicable renewables directive or even go, go further uh, than this. So this will be positively uh, evaluated and may bring you additional points in the degree of innovation. Um, now, one more technical question is, uh, um, if you apply to the, to the Innovation Fund uh, and you are an energy intensive industry, do you have to respect the size and the production rate limits outlined in Annex 1 of the EU ETS Directive? Maybe I take that one directly myself. No. You have to be an energy intensive industry but um, if, you're, if you are a smaller project, eh, in particular for the small scale call, uh, most, uh, most welcome. And maybe I think because, okay, no, Maria is, is support. No, but I'm, Roman, I'm, I'm interested uh, in the one uh, that, that we, we always see there is, by how many persons is a project uh, evaluated? So each, each project is evaluated by six experts, two greenhouse gas emission experts, two technical experts, and two financial experts. Okay, and, um, and another one, a little bit more on the, on the process. Um, so, do you, would you consider, uh, you're not anymore INEA, but CINEA, uh, because you, are, you have now the, the C for climate uh, in, in there, um, yeah, why, why don't uh, the applicants get uh, uh, an analysis of all the five criteria? Because in the small scale uh, projects we had a so-called cascade evaluation, uh, I understand that it would be very useful for the, for the applicants to receive a full evaluation report. We also, uh, on the other hand, have to consider the, the constraint and timing and efficiency of the process. So that's why the, the, the cascade approach was taken. Um, so you, you, were, you, you have seen that uh, we went through degree of innovation and then uh, greenhouse gas emissions project maturity and at the end, the scalability. Uh, we shall see how uh, we will do the next calls, whether we will uh, continue with the cascade or not. It seemed from uh, the point of view of managing the evaluation well, that the cascade approach uh, worked quite efficiently. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we will see in the future, we, we, can, we can change this if, uh, if, uh, if needed. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm right that um, like those projects that we or the evaluators consider as, a, as having a very big, uh, big potential, so being very high scored on degree of innovation, they get the full report. Yes, those that pass the degree of innovation will receive the, uh, the, uh, the evaluation report, for instance, on, on maturity uh, and greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So this only relates to those that fail already degree of innovation who are not assessed and then they will not receive the other criteria being evaluated. Yeah, so I think that's an important one. Huh? Yeah. Um, okay, we are, we are already talking about uh, innovation. So. What, what are the criteria that, um, that the project scores high on, uh, on innovation? Roman, do you also want to take this or we make a change? As you wish. 
I can, I can. Uh, we already mentioned that we have two sub-criteria. First, that the project uh, goes beyond the state of the art, and second, that it goes beyond incremental innovation. Yes. No, and I think what, what I can add or what I see is that we, that in degree of innovation, we really get good projects huh? that are really like doing something for the first uh, time in, in in the sector, really having an innovative approach. Uh, we see a lot uh, on uh, on sector integration, on circular economy. Uh, yeah, there's there's really good uh, good stuff uh, in there. So I think uh, yeah, uh, just uh, like incremental innovation is is really not uh, not enough uh, to make the to make the cut uh, under the Innovation Fund. Okay, here we have a, we have a good question about uh, how, how can I get more information about the errors in the GHG emission calculations? Um, I don't know, Maria, could this be a question for you? Uh, yes, uh, I could uh, answer. Actually, well, uh, we have, uh, first of all, if you're an applicant, you have re received an evaluation summary uh, report uh, where uh, the errors will be indicated. Perhaps that is uh, too short and uh, maybe you don't understand. Uh, then uh, the best way is to actually ask a specific uh, question in the help desk. And actually, uh, we provide a lot of detailed answers in the help desk uh, with regards to any part of the application process and the criteria. So we answer a lot of questions on the greenhouse gas emission calculations. So if you have any doubts whatsoever, the best way is to use the help desk uh, to uh, receive a question, an answer which is specific to your case as an applicant. Okay, thanks a lot, Maria. I think in view of time, we will move on to the second part of, um, uh, of our webinar today and more look into the additional funding uh, through national programs, through state aid. And uh, we will definitely uh, come back to all your questions. They are all uh, uh, well stored and we'll have a look uh, at them. But now, uh, without further ado, I would like to pass on to Jan from the uh, Dutch Rechtsdienst um, uh, over, um, how? I, I, I forgot the, the, English, uh, the English name, uh, but you will tell it uh, surely in, in a second, Jan. So very much looking forward to uh, getting to know more about the Dutch uh, SDE++ initiative. All right. Good afternoon. Now I'm in the lobby of a, of a trade show. Maybe a little bit noisy over here, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, to keep the other sounds uh, out of out of the presentation. Um, my name is Jan Balke Achterhuis. I'm a policy advisor at uh, uh, RVO, the uh, agency that works uh, for the Ministry of Economic Affairs that uh, sets out all kinds of uh, subsidy schemes. Among them is the SDE++. That's the main subsidy scheme for sustainable energy and CO2 uh, reduction in the industry. Uh, and I hope to uh, explain uh, how we do that. All right, the next uh, slide. Uh, the SD++ is an exploitation subsidy with a duration of 12 of, uh, or 15 years. Uh, and until 2020, you had uh, 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 the main categories that only were concerning renewable energy. Uh, well, that were uh, renewable electricity for solar power, wind, water, and, uh, and biomass, and renewable gas, that was uh, digestion and gasification of uh, biomass. Um, one moment, my telephone. And renewable heat, uh, that's uh, solar, so solar thermal heat, biomass, and uh, geothermal uh, heat. Uh, we changed the SD plus uh, into the SD plus uh, plus, and we did a round from uh, the uh, autumn of uh, 2020, and that includes other CO2 reduction options, and uh, that included uh, low carbon heat with uh, industrial heat pumps, use of waste heat, uh, e-boilers, and low carbon productions uh, with the use of uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and uh, storage. Yeah, uh, yeah. To to make a, a smaller explanation on on the concepts of the SDE plus uh, plus, we have a base amount. That's the maximum amount you can ask for 
per category, the solar, wind, they all have their own uh, base amounts. Uh, those uh, base amounts are uh, calculated as an integral uh, cost price uh, of renewable or the low carbon uh, product. In CCS, we have a price in Europe a ton CO2, and all the other categories have uh, an, uh, a base amount that's uh, in Europe per kilowatt hour. Th these base, base amounts are cal calculated by PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. Um, Included in the base amount is uh, the relevant capex costs, including uh, a WEC, so the uh, the costs on, uh, on 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 the capital, weighted average cost on capital, and the OPEX cost over the subsidy term. And the application amounts that people ask for must be equal the base amount. That's the maximum amount. Next to that, we have a correction amount. That's the actual, actual cost price of the non-renewable or higher carbon alternative. So that means for electricity options, we have the elect electricity price that is set every year on the, the apex, the apex day ahead price. We have uh, the gas price or heat uh, price for uh, that's calculated out of the gas price. And that's cal calculated on the TTF market year ahead price. And for CCS, we have, the, of course, the CO2 price for uh, AEX, OIA, uh, the price that is set for, uh, for CO2. And, and the SDE contribution is the difference between the application amount and the correction amount. And to make a, to make, make a, a view of that, oh, sorry, that's one too much. This, this is uh, what happens over the subsidy period, the subsidy term. Uh, every year you have a... Uh, market price that are those uh, green bars and you have the, the upper left this is the re requested amount the, the 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 base amount this no that has to be lower than the base amount that's the people that make a request for the sde they set their own price and that's this blue line over here and the payments for the sde in every year are those uh, purple bars that's uh th that are shown over here and you see that if the Market price is higher than the requested amount. That we that's the moment that we stop paying a subsidy. So in this moment we have a very very high electricity pricing. That means that we we're not paying at this moment for the uh, renewable electricity options. Um, last year we had the first round on the SD plus plus. So in, it was the first round that we had the uh, low CO two options uh, together with. Uh, the renewable options, and I've uh, colored them uh, yellow uh, uh, to see the industrial options that we added last year. This was uh, CCS. We had uh, six projects around it with a total of 2.1 uh, billion euro to 2.3 megaton uh, CO2 reduction every year. Um, solar PV is, of, of course, uh, still very big, and uh, especially in, uh, in numbers. Uh, we had the first uh, e-boilers that were subsidized last year. There were some industrial heat pumps. Uh, wind is, 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 is slowly uh, going down. There's still less, pro still less projects that uh, ask for SDE subsidy. Uh, we had a very few bi biomass uh, projects, a few residual heat, that is uh, use of, uh, of waste heat, two projects. Uh, a little bit on the biomass uh, gas and uh, even uh, less on the solar thermal energy. Uh, we have a budget of uh, 5 billion euro. Um, now, th at that moment that we, I made this list, it was not all uh, uh, given to the projects yet. At the moment, uh, we have ended already uh, the uh, 2020 uh, uh, scheme and we are now open on the 2021 uh, scheme. Too much. Yep. We uh, opened uh, last week, on 5th October, and people could uh, uh, ask for a maximum of uh, 60 euro per ton. Um, yesterday we went open for 80 euro per ton and so on. So every week we open for a higher, uh, and you can ask for, uh, for a higher uh, amount of money, and, and that's uh, we, we don't really do a tender, but uh, with, with this uh, phased application, uh, with, with still uh, higher values, 
you're able to uh, to to get the the cheapest projects in in front, and the most uh, more expensive uh, projects can ask for the uh, at the end uh, for an SDE uh, a grant. So we open from uh, five October to uh, eleven November. It's the phase opening, but on the day we. Uh, we, we handle uh, the applications uh, fast come fast serve. The subsidy intensity, that's how you can ask for an SDE, is uh, calculated out of the, uh, the difference of the application amount and the long-term price. And the long-term price is the expected correction amount over the years that your uh, subsidy runs. So we, we, we have a calculation of, uh, say, the electricity price for the coming 15 years. That's the long-term price. And to make a comparison between uh, renewable electricity, renewable heat, CCS, we use an emission factor, and uh, that's uh, uh, written down in ton CO2 per kilowatt hour or ton CO2 per kilogram CO2. To, to make all those options comparable to each other. And that's how uh, people can ask for the SDE and uh, how the SDE is, uh, is granted. First come, first serve, until uh, all the, the budget is, uh, is, is given to uh, the applicants. And that's a very short uh, presentation on the SDE++. Thanks so much, Jan. Uh, very interesting to see uh, a little bit of a, of a different approach uh, than the innovation one, but in principle, uh, we, are, we are trying to do, to do the same thing. So, and I think or that can be the, a good, um, uh, good start of, of, of a discussion. Uh, how can we also learn from each other and also maybe over, over time, uh, uh, yeah, uh, maybe become a little bit more, more consistent also in, in, more, in more details. Uh, and as I know that there are also many other member states are looking into, into such, such schemes. And uh, yeah, if, if there's an interest for, okay, for learning best practices and, and so on, uh, yeah, I think this is something we would be very keen, uh, keen to do. And uh, an right. important framework for, for that are, of course, the new state aid uh, guidelines. And I think we'll go immediately into um, the, the presentation by Alejandro on on the state aid, and then take the questions at uh, at the end. Uh, and I think we should have a, a good uh, good time for this. So, okay, we are already here uh, with the presentation. So I hope uh, Alejandro, you are also online. Yes, I'm okay. here. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. a very warm warm welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone in, in the audience, for your presence and for listening today. I'm going to uh, present to you uh, the uh, revision of the stated guidelines on energy and environmental protection that will go under the new name of uh, SAG, also to include the word uh, climate. Um, first, let me see if I can just click in. There we go. Okay, so as, as you know, uh, the current guidelines are the guidelines on the state aid for environmental protection and energy that were adopted in mid-2014. Uh, and these guidelines already are a good framework uh, for member states to, to support uh, several areas of, of the Green Deal. I mean, they allow, obviously, for support for renewables, for decarbonization, but also circularity, zero pollution. So they are already uh, a good uh, basis for uh, a framework for supporting member states to achieve the, the climate targets. In 2019, we did a fitness check or an evaluation of the guidelines. Um, and the results told us that they had worked uh, well in general, but that there were some shortcomings, some problems, in particular looking ahead to the future, uh, and in particular looking at the huge challenge that the Green Deal represents uh, for uh, member states. I mean, the, the green transition, it's a, a huge challenge for, for the European Union, and we thought we needed to, to have a fully revised guidelines 
to really be able to to support member states on on this so we did uh, several consultations during the last uh, year uh we had in in autumn 2020 we had the inception impact assessment and also uh, an open public consultation on the basis of a questionnaire uh, making questions to to stakeholders i think in that one we had more than 300 stakeholders providing contributions then we also carried out a detailed support study that was published in, in june 2021 and that is uh, accessible and available in in our website and then more recently just before the summer we carried out a, an eight-week consultation on the draft text of the new guidelines. Um, and the idea is to have them uh, adopted before the end of, of this year so that they can enter in force uh, at the beginning of next year. In this recent consultation, uh, the last one, as, as you can see, I mean, there is a high degree of stakeholders uh, involvement. I said in the first consultation we had more than 300 contributions, but in the one of the draft text of the guidelines we had almost 740 contributions from uh, all type of stakeholders, but mainly uh, companies uh, and organizations, but also the member states or public authorities and some NGOs and, and citizens. And the, the sections of the guidelines that you can see in, in the chart below, uh, there were some that attracted most most of the comments uh, from the stakeholders, one on, on exemptions from levies uh, for energy intensive uses, but also the new section on greenhouse gas reduction emissions uh, is where we have gotten many, many comments from, from stakeholders. So the main uh, summary of those comments uh, from stakeholders um we can say that overall they see the the new guidelines or proposed guidelines uh, in a very positive manner uh they like uh, that we have a, a larger and wider scope uh and possibilities for supporting uh investments and and green deal transition investments um and also they appreciate the effort that we have done in trying to align fully with EU policies and, and legislation with the different uh, legislative packages, not only with the existing ones like the clean energy package, but also looking forward uh, with the Fit for 55 package. Obviously, and that's something that uh, we could expect, and I will explain now in, in more detail uh, our approach to fossil fuels, uh we got comments that are split i mean there is always people that want us to be even more ambitious uh in terms of greening the the economy and completely stopping any kind of subsidies for uh fossil fuels and others that understand that uh those fossil fuels gas for sure but even others mentioned other fossil fuels could be a transition fuel uh on the way to the 2050 climate neutrality target. Also, we got comments from, from stakeholders asking for more facilitation, less tendering, uh, and higher amounts of aid, obviously, in particular, those that expect to, to benefit from, from those measures, and also uh, more flexibility, reduced level of justifications from, from member states, potentially let, less administrative burden, uh, requested from, from member states when, when designing the, the schemes. So that's a little bit to, to put you in, in the context. Uh, and now uh, I want to give you like a quick snapshot of um, the, the new guidelines that we have proposed that, as I said, we intend to uh, adopt uh, before the end of the year. So first, uh, to, to explain a little bit the rationale no, of, of this revision. So we aim at enlarging the, the scope of the guidelines so that they can allow for wider variety of activities, uh, which are necessary to achieve the, the union's green deal and energy objectives. In the new guidelines, we have tried to move away from the rules per, te per technology that we had in the current ones, no, that are very technology, um, compartmentalize, I would say, 
uh, and where possible, we have tried to find common rules for a wider range uh, of activities. And the idea is to to simplify the the rule book, uh, but also to make it more future proof uh, and facilitate the schemes, which include a wider variety of of different type of projects that can compete. And precisely one example that we always put of a, let's say, wider scope scheme is the SD++ that was just uh, presented uh, before, before me. Uh, in the guidelines also, the rationale try to, to make it easier to use a different type of, uh, or different types of aid instruments. So we are not being prescriptive in the type of instruments that, that need to be used so we we are open to investment aid operating aid but also contracts for differences uh, one way two ways so on that the guidelines are pretty open um and finally we have to say that obviously these are stated guidelines competition guidelines that need to ensure that uh the distortions to competition are, are minimized. So we have proposed some safeguards uh, to, to make sure that the aid goes really where it's needed to, to, to improve the environmental protection. Also that is limited to what is really needed, no, and, and no more than, than that. And as I said, that does not have a, a negative impact on uh, the competition or in the integrity of the, uh, of the internal market. And also here, I want to explain a little bit the, the approach as regards uh, the fossil fuels, because, oh, sorry, or oh, oh, yeah, the different type of fuels that can um, be supported, uh, because we really want these guidelines to 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 make a step forward, uh, recognize the the important role of climate policies, uh, and we want really these guidelines to to support. The, the green deal, the, the green transition. No, that's why, as I said, we have included a, a new word also in, in the title or, or name of the guidelines, which is climate. But in general, these guidelines uh, will take a, a relatively strict approach to fossil fuels, as you can see in, in the three bullet points at the bottom, in particular in, in the one at the bottom. Assuming that the investments that uh, go into coal or similarly polluting fuels are generally prohibited. Um, and for gas, uh, we adopt uh, a position that is yes, we recognize that is uh, important for the transition uh, in order to achieve the, the objectives. Uh, but we have to make sure that those gas investments are fully compatible with the 2030 and 2050 uh, targets. And obviously, in this context, to facilitate as much as uh, as much as it's possible, uh, those measures that are green. So, how are these green measures facilitated further? As I mentioned at the beginning, or just before, uh, we are enlarging the scope of the guidelines. Uh, the new guidelines allow for uh, aid in new areas or uh, into all technologies that can deliver the, the Green Deal. No, as I say, we, we have, let's say, made clear uh, that support for industrial decarbonization is possible, but we have added new chapters like in clean mobility infrastructure, resource efficiency, biodiversity, and then uh, all type of technology. So we are talking about renewable, but also low carbon hydrogen, e-storage. So everything that can deliver to reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, that's in the, let's say, in the in the, the specific area, but also to other objectives uh, supported by the Green Deal or, or pursued by the Green Deal, they they are possible under the, the new guidelines. And at the same time, we try to combat, to make the, the rules more flexible. We allow now for higher aid amounts. Uh, up to 100% of the funding gap. Uh, if you know the current guidelines, in some areas we had the, the approach of uh, maximum aid intensities that sometimes limited as a, the, the maximum amount of aid that could be provided. Now uh, we are looking at the funding gap 
uh, in a specific uh, preference projects or particular projects, and then 100% of it could be supported with aid. But also new type of aid instruments, as I as I mentioned before, for example, carbon contract for for differences. And also we try to look at at an easier assessment of of cross cutting measures, and we are taking away a requirement that we had in the current guidelines. Uh, and for gener for measures, individual measures already within an approved scheme, uh, in principle, they will not need to be notified, contrary to what it is the case today, that we have a threshold that an individual measure, even if it's included within an approved scheme, if it goes above a certain size, the budget needs to be notified uh, to be assessed individually. Uh, security of supply may be a very particular area, uh, capacity mechanisms, strategic reserves. Uh, in that area, we have uh, a law for member states to introduce a stricter environmental requirements if they want so. No? Obviously, we are uh, bringing into our guidelines all the new legislation from the electricity regulation as regards capacity mechanism and security of supply measures. But we are going to step forward and we are allowing member states to even be stricter in the environmental requirements that they put uh, to, these, to these measures. And finally, an important element that I shouldn't forget is the GBER, the General Block Exemption Regulation. Uh, in parallel to the guidelines, uh, we are reviewing uh, some sections of the GBER, of the General Block Exemption Regulation, in particular, uh, the section seven, which is the one related to environmental protection. Uh, the public consultation of the draft text of the GBER was just uh, launched, I think, uh, three three days ago, or okay, oh, oh, just last week, if I recall properly. Um, and it will go for, for uh, eight weeks. And here we have new articles for new measures, for example, on clean mobility as I mentioned also in the guidelines, but we have higher thresholds uh, in terms of investment per undertaking and per project than we had before. Those thresholds have been increased and therefore more measures would find a uh, possibility under the general block inception regulation. And also we have increased higher aid intensities uh, we have increased the, the maximum aid intensities for, for some of these measures under the GBER, in particular for those that are greener. As I said, we had included also in, in the guidelines uh, some safe, safeguards um, to, to ensure that this wider scope and more flexibilization uh, does not unduly distort competition. And for example, uh, I can mention here that in the section for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We have proposed a, a new requirement, which is public consultation uh, that member states should do of the schemes before uh, proposing them to us uh, or notifying them to us so that they take into account stakeholders' views uh, and competition, in particular competition aspects of the schemes that they uh, intend to, to implement uh, before they are actually implemented. And also, we think it's good we have included another requirement, which is the quantification or calculation of CO2 uh, abatement cost, uh, which uh, that was something that was not uh, requested uh, until now in the state aid rules. Now, we think it's a good idea uh, that will push uh, member states to, to really see what is the cost of achieving the environmental benefit uh and uh we believe it's 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 a good way of make sure that the green transition is done in a um, cost efficient uh, manner um let's see if i can go to the next slide there we go and as i said i mentioned here a little bit of more detail on how we will treat uh what we call gray investments or Face, face out of, of brown investments. So for gas, which is what we call grey, uh, we want to avoid locking effects and, and make sure that the, those investments are compatible with the 2030 and 2050 targets. 
So for example, in infrastructure, we will ask that the infrastructure is ready for, for hydrogen. Um, as you see there also for, for gas vehicles and refueling infrastructure, uh, will be subject to, to make sure that there are no other linear alternatives already available in, in the market. Uh, we try to avoid that there are locking effects for cleaner technologies and also that no stranded costs are created uh, to this, uh, due to these investments in gas that we believe are necessary for, for the transition, but that we will be scrutinizing in a, in a more detailed manner. And for brown measures or fossil fuels, uh, which are uh, most polluting, we believe that they are very unlikely to have uh, positive environmental effects uh, and that they can create a negative environmental externalities. And therefore, it would be very difficult to prove in our balancing test when putting the positive and the negative on, on the other side, it will be very difficult for us to, to obtain a positive result in this balancing test, and therefore it will be um, difficult to, to to assume that aid can be granted for those for those measures. Finally, um, again, I already mentioned it, but to reiterate this public consultation that we just launched, uh, and you have the link at the bottom on the revision of the general block exemption regulation. As I said, we are having an horizontal enlargement of the GBER with uh, revised provisions to make sure that CCUS is there, storage, but also make clear that green hydrogen uh, can be supported, but also opening the door for renewable energy communities on the renewable side. Then we have new provisions that we didn't have before, in particular on the clean mobility side and then we have a wider scope for um, biodiversity resource efficiency and then as i said also vertical enlargement with higher notification thresholds in in all areas and uh allowing higher aid intensities up to 100 percent uh, when the aid is granted via competitive bidding and then allowing for some green bonus in, in some areas uh, that can give you uh, an additional a percentage in the maximum aid intensity. So that's uh, my presentation today. I hope uh, you got a um, high level view of what we are trying to, to achieve with this revision of the guidelines and how uh, we're going to look at um, energy or climate energy and environmental protection measures in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Uh, yeah, very interesting overview, and I think a lot of uh, uh, possibilities also for uh, for the projects that uh, that we are most concerned about. Innovation project, uh, also uh, the the cheaper, the new proposed cheaper rules can be very attractive uh, for smaller innovative projects. Uh, you've seen CCUS in in there, but of course, and as you've seen, uh, the SDE plus plus is uh, um, an aid scheme that fits uh, perfectly within the, um, the state aid guidelines. I mean, still the current one, but then also the new ones, and I think it will even fit better into, into the new ones. So do we have uh, some, some questions to open, to open the discussion? <laughs> OK. Um, OK, one. Listen, the only only very uh, only very few questions and i understand jan is still there to answer on the sd plus plus that's why i'm highlighting those there are two questions okay let's get going with with this so um is the production of building materials with co2 and without cement uh also covered by the sd plus plus jan are you there yeah, I'm still there. No, I'm not at this moment. Uh, the, uh, last year we did only uh, CO2 uh, capture and storage, and this year we hope to open on uh, CO2 capture and uh, and use, but only for greenhouse uh, uh, CO2 for greenhouses. So not for uh, building materials. Not so. Not so. So far, no. No. Okay. Just the SD. 
And, and another one for you, uh, what about energy storage? At this moment, no. But we're looking at it because we have still we have uh, problems with our grid, so uh, we're, we're thinking about how, how that should work out in the SDE. Okay. And are you are you then regularly reviewing the SDE plus plus? So will be the then soon a triple plus? <laughs> no, we try to keep it in the SDE plus <laughs> plus, but we're reviewing uh, the, the the scheme every year, so. Uh, you, you can make uh, proposals for new categories uh, within the SD every year. So. Okay, good to good to hear. Um, and then um, over to Alejandro. So there seem to be two questions a bit about the the timing. So when can we can we expect that the uh, new climate energy environment guidelines will be adopted, and uh, the same for the general block exemption regulation? For the new guidelines, uh, we are currently finalizing the, the drafting of the guidelines. As I said, we, we received uh, 740 almost uh, contributions from stakeholders to, to the draft text. So we are going almost finalizing, going through all the assessment of those and um, doing the changes that we find appropriate into the draft text. Uh, then it should go the internal adoption procedure by, by the college. And the idea is that they are adopted in the month of uh, December so that they can still be published in December uh, so that they can enter in force uh, 1st uh, January. So that's the, the, the timeline adoption before the end, adoption and publication uh, before the end of the year so that uh, they can enter into force at the beginning of, of the year. Regarding the, the general block exemption regulation, the GBER, uh, indeed, it's a, I would say it's a pity that there is some sort of delay in the in the approval. Obviously, it's a, a more complicated uh, procedure because it's a, it's a regulation. The guidelines is a communication from the Commission. Um, the GBIR is a regulation. It needs to go through two advisory committees uh, with member states, so it takes a little bit longer. The idea is that the new GBIR is adopted uh by mid next year um so mid 2022 so in principle there will be uh six months more or less in which the hopefully the new guidelines will be already in place and what we will be waiting for for the jiver but i think uh, you can already see what uh, are the proposals for 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 the new jiver or, or for the revised Jiver is not all, all sections, it's, it's a targeted revision of some of the sections. Um, and the idea has been always, I mean, we have been working on, on parallel uh, with both uh, texts. As I said, procedurally, one goes slower than the other, but the idea is that they are really complementary uh, and that uh, those uh, measures that are greener and, and less problematic find an easy uh, way of going through under the GBER and those that deserve being assessed in more detail because of their potential impact on competition are assessed under uh, the guidelines. But uh, it's a parallel revision as I say, with some delay in the adoption, but both uh, should be seen as, uh, as complementing each other. Okay, thanks a lot. So by Mid next year, we should be very clear on on the new state aid uh, uh, framework, both for uh, large projects, so they're already from, from January, but then also for smaller projects um, as from July. But talking about smaller, uh, Alejandro, I, I understand so the cheaper uh, will will apply or can apply also to quite uh, quite big projects. Well, Jiber, um, and I look at the, the general threshold, although in some specific areas, the thresholds, I don't remember all of them, but are a little bit higher. Nowadays, we have a 15 million threshold for uh, per uh, undertaking per project. Uh, in our proposal, we are increasing it to 20 million. But we have to take into account that this threshold is the maximum amount of aid not the total size of the project. So taking into account that sometimes the maximum amount of aid is 40%, then 
you can easily calculate the the, the amount of or the size of the whole project. No. Yeah. So the cheaper could uh, could even be interesting for uh, for what what we call large scale uh, project, because with our, with us the limit is uh, a small scale project is defined as capital expenditure up to seven point five. A million years, then definitely falling under under the Chiba. Um, but uh, but then also projects that uh, are called with us uh, large scale projects can can benefit from the from the Chiba. Um, yeah, and then I think a very uh, very timely question then about the accumulation of uh, of funding. So between uh, I, uh, programs like us, the Innovation Fund. And um, and then uh, uh, state aid. So I think in terms of the of the accumulation rules, um, there's no uh, no change, or it it will still be the same uh, the same principle, Alejandro. Indeed, in principle, accumulation it's uh, it's uh, not allowed, uh, and. Um, Especially if it goes exactly to cover the same cost, no. Uh, in that case, is is more complicated. If it covers different costs, yes, there are some possibilities, but in, the, the rules for accumulation will not will not change uh, in neither on the Giver or or the SAC. Okay, thanks a lot. We've uh, we finished with. Uh... With our questions, so yes, indeed, there are no more questions on the state aid guidelines coming from Slido. Uh, of course, there are some more questions which came in the meantime on the innovation fund. But depending on how much time, more time you want to take, uh, we can display them or not. Uh, I guess we we could still do a five uh, five minutes if there are. Um, uh, like different topics that we haven't yet uh, yet covered, but I, I leave it to you, Maria, how you how you see it. I, actually, sorry, there's one perhaps interesting question on the state aid which just came. Uh, I'm like using the opportunity that Alexander is with us. Maybe it's an important one. Last one on that. Ah, okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, difficult difficult one. <laughs> Uh, that I'm not sure I will be fully able to to replay it uh, because the IPCI communication is not my my area of expertise. Um, I think these are two different sets of rules, and and IPCI communication has very clear rules on what can fall under that. No, it has to be an IPCI project, uh, and uh, that includes. I mean that implies some some conditions that I don't I really um, that I don't really um, know all of them no but as I said there are some projects that can be developed under IPCI and if they meet the conditions for those they can go under the IPCI uh, it involves the participation of several member states at the same time I think it's for early stages of development of the projects so while in their SEAC, normally first you, you look at, guide, at the projects that are or, or schemes that are member state specific, so they don't need to be in the framework of an IPCI. Uh, they don't need to be done in conjunction with other member states with a minimum of uh, member states participating. And um, they do not cover only the, the initial stages of, of the projects, but also they can provide a full support to, to a project during the, the, the whole life uh, and, for example, in a renewables power plant to get operating aid uh, during a number of, of years now. So it's it's uh, it's true that there might be some, and I think it's a, a discussion, uh, very interesting one, which is normally hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is, is an area where there are many ways to to support it along the uh, along the value chain. Uh, you can have hydrogen supported uh, by the research, development, and innovation guidelines. If there are measures that fall under that, you have can have hydrogen under IPCIs, or you can have hydrogen projects, uh, production of hydrogen, 
or uh, industrial decarbonization of uh, some industries based on, on hydrogen that would fall under the the SAG. It depends on on as I say on on the type of project and the involvement of, uh, of the member states or not. Also, if it can be qualified as an IPCI. Okay, many thanks, many thanks, Alejandro. Uh, there are still two questions that I'll I'll take before we we close. Um, the innovation fund um, is it state aid? No, clearly not. It's not it's not state aid. But what can be interesting uh, for you is to combine uh, the innovation fund support with uh, with state aid under the under the Chiba. So, and once we have uh, the final rules under the Chiba. I think uh, we should uh, look into this uh, again into more into more detail. Um, and then the last question, which I avoided uh, up to now, but it seems you are interested in it, when we will have the, the results of the uh, <coughs> large-scale call. And uh, we are still working towards uh, the second half of uh, of November. So we'll keep you we'll keep you updated. Uh, on this, but this is still a work in progress. Um, with this, I, I thank you a lot for your interest again uh, in the Innovation Fund. Um, I, I thank all, all the colleagues. Uh, I, I, I thank um, our consultants from ICF who have supported us. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon again at one of our events, be it uh, with the Sustainable Energy Week, um, be it with uh, the signing of our first uh, uh, small-scale projects in November, or then uh, 10th of November with the uh, webinar on, uh, on the call text for the second call for our uh, uh, 1.5 billion euros that we are putting out uh, for the next uh, large-scale call. OK, so far, thank you very much. Have a nice uh, day still, nice evening, and see you soon. Bye.